Hello everyone, I've been using Airflow for the last three years and I've seen it grown from version 1.10 to currently I think it's a 2.6. So I have over the period uh, collected and compiled and helped various teams use it, uh, integrate it as their workflow orchestrator tool. And this talk is a compilation of all the drama, all the chaos, all the best, bad, worst things they've done with it. And here I am to tell you what to do and what not to do. Uh, before we move on, how many of you already use Airflow as a part of your pipeline? And how many of you are thinking to incorporate Airflow into your ecosystem? OK, if you're already using, this talk will be so relatable because you might have made these mistakes, stumbled through these blocks, and came here. If you're thinking to incorporate, maybe uh, watch out for all these issues. With that, it all started when I was on a trip uh, with a friend, and she was just sitting there. It was a workation. We were just sitting there, um, and she was watching her screen, printing logs after logs after logs. And I was like, what are you doing? Oh, this particular task has been running. It, it runs for about two hours. I just have to watch if there are any deadlines coming. I was like, what? Why don't you use something like Airflow? Right? I was using Airflow pretty much for a year or so until that point. And is there a system that can automate your scripts so that you don't have to be a hawk and watch it 24 bar 7? Yes, there is. And that tool is Airflow, a workflow or orchestrator to which you can say what to run, when to run, how to run, and what happens as a result. So that's Airflow for you. How do you do it is uh, it is all Python based. So you define a DAG, and you tell it what your tasks are. And finally, how do you combine them as a workflow? So here is my beautiful hello and bye. And here is a more complicated example. You can do branches. You can do uh, some uh, a decision based on a particular output and stuff like that. It can get crazy. So before we move on to further uh, chaos and stories around that, here is uh, some simple DAGs I have written. Uh, one is our, just the example that we saw, the print hello and print by, which is very straightforward. You can add more tasks to it. Uh, the other one is a dynamic task mapping, which I want to show. Uh, let's say you want to copy a bunch of files from one S3 bucket to another S3 bucket it can get as crazy as this. You get all your inputs and then test if uh, something is right or wrong, and then uh, generate this source and destination pairs of all your files. And then this particular task I want to emphasize is uh, given your source and destination, you can spin up dynamic tasks on the fly, let's say you have to copy 100 uh, files, then you will have 100 different tasks created out of this particular task and delete all the 100 simultaneously. So it just, it just does this amazingly. These are brand new features of Apache Airflow I want to bring up to the surface because it's very common for people to look at old blogs, old uh, things, and say, oh, Airflow, it's not there yet. No, it is there yet, and these brand new features are my favorite. There are also connections for you to connect to external sources safely, and all your credentials can live here. And if you want to integrate any specific variables, uh, you can have it under variables. This is if you have never seen Airflow. These are some of the major things that I would uh, start with. So I introduce you to Airflow. You are almost sold that this might be a tool for you. And the first question they ask is, which Airflow version to use? And I don't blame you. People like Jarek and so many brilliant people are behind Airflow. And they do this crazy thing like s deploying 12 different versions in one year. And it is pretty common. How do we even catch up as an Airflow developer? Uh, so yeah, when it comes to choosing which version of Airflow again, go to the latest version that is there. Look at all the features. I personally do not use 0.0 versions because it's brand new. And there is a possibility that those new features can come with a bit of a regression. So I would wait for a couple of more versions. So if I were to choose at this point, my choice would be 2.5.3, unless I really, really need something with 2.6.0. Uh, and again, beware of the old blogs and documentation. If you're using um, the 
GitHub Copilot, it is going to generate old code. It is not generating the new Python syntax whatsoever, so just be aware of it. Just to add, uh, we just released two six two years. Oh, why do you people do this to me? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> ouch. <laughs> So the second problem is it's so simple to use, and that's how it looks. Right? You go to Airflow, and you go to the Get Started page. Some manager decides, OK, let's do use Airflow, and we go to the Get Started page. This is how it looks like now. You install and do Airflow standalone, and here is my Airflow running. Actually, the example I showed you from, was from my local, and these are my tags, and it creates this beautiful environment. It has a requirements file and everything, uh, and you can easily see all the tags spinning up on the fly. Very pretty simple to use, and the first problem was the manager thinking, it should only take a week to set you up. This looks pretty solid. Unfortunately, no, don't get sold by that. There is a lot more thing going on behind the scenes. So I'm going to introduce you to the Airflow components that's at play. So before you decide it's only going to take one week for you to get everything done, probably not. So the brain of Airflow, as we call it, is the scheduler, which is going to keep track of all your DAGs that you have written in Python. And it's going to update this metadata database, which is going to keep track of what your DAGs are, what the tasks are, uh, when it should run, what are the tasks that has ran, what is the status of it, whether it's success, failure, everything. And comes the workers who is going to take all the load that you're going to put on it. Every task that you spin up is going to run on workers. And you have a web server and user interface to monitor and track all of this. Yes, there's so much going on behind the scenes, and we need infrastructure to support all of that. Let's say you're running 100 tasks. The scheduler should manage, uh, keep, it, uh, keep note of all these 100 tasks, and it has to spin up 100 uh, offloaded to different workers. And the metadata database should be, uh, uh, should be proficient enough to have those 100 connections open and 100 connections closed. And all of this should happen behind the scenes. Uh, we saw workers and Airflow, like it is behind the view, they always give you general purpose tools, and you can manage, uh, manipulate it to behave in the way that you want. So workers, though it looks like a simple thing, it comes in varieties, and you have to choose which one to go with. And every time there is a choice, there is a consultant involved, and they come to ask, come and ask me, what executor should I use? So these are the options that we have: local, Celery. Kubernetes and Celery and Kubernetes combined together. Local, if you're testing it in local, I would suggest use this. Or if you're like really, really small pipelines with not a lot of workload, go for it. But if you have anything more than a GB of data that is going to pass through, just don't go with uh, local. Go for Celery or Kubernetes or Celery plus Kubernetes. Celery and Kubernetes have a very close fight in the Airflow ecosystem because both of them does their job wonderfully. Uh, the slight nuance between those two. So if you're using uh, Celery, you will have independent workers, which is going to be always on, looking for tasks to execute. Whereas if you're going to use Kubernetes, uh, the scheduler uh, will decide how many particular tasks it should spin up. So each task will run on an individual pod the advantage of that is you can say how much resource I'm going to allocate for the particular task versus how, what volume should this particular task mount to. So that is manip uh, you can manipulate it at the task level. So whether which executor to use, if you want isolation, go for Kubernetes. If you are running very short, high volume tasks, then go for Celery. If you have one task which is going to be very resource hungry, uh, go for Kubernetes. And with uh, Celery, it's going to be always on. You're going to have workers running 24 bar 7, which means there is a resource uh, co consume, consumption there. This is uh, Kubernetes. It's going to be on demand. With Kubernetes, it also comes with a little bit of latency. So if latency is a metric that you're going to be heavily relying on, then uh, please be aware of that. Database. This slide is the one that is most uh, close to my heart because I haven't seen people uh, using it at this level. First thing is, so far what I've shown you works on an SQLite. And the moment you have to spin up more connections, it's going to bomb. So please switch to Postgres. This might sound, sound so obvious, but unfortunately it was not. Uh, second one was managed services versus Docker images. 
here comes a client opening up their airflow to me and then shows, uh, we had two airflow environments. Uh, it had pass runs and suddenly one environment, everything vanished. What happened? They had their Postgres in a Docker image, no mount volumes, unfortunately. And the Docker image, <laughs> Docker container vanished. All their data vanished. This is the real story. So please be aware of this. Uh, if you are using and it's working perfectly fine, uh, just be aware of like wh where is it actually running? What is it actually using? Uh, there was another team which was like bump, keep pumping max connections of Postgres because they wanted more and more and more connections. But that is definitely not the way to go. It sounds so common, but it is not. Uh, so use something like a PG Bouncer for managing your connections. Uh, these are some things that you can do out of the box without a lot of effort. Uh, that would save so much time uh, than working on a P1 or P0 issue. Now comes the best and the worst part. I think this is uh, close to my heart because I was a software engineer. I was only building backend APIs until that point, And I was thrown into this Airflow project, to be very precise. And I had no clue how to think about Airflow project. Uh, if you have to manage workflows on Airflow, here is like three, four slides telling you how to exactly go about it. Pipeline design. We all do software design. We all do modules. We all do architecture. This is something I insist my clients to do day in and day out. What are your workflows? What are your tasks? What is the inputs of those tasks? What are the possible outputs, good and the bad? And what happens in case of a failure? I always tell them to optimize for failure. Please, please think uh, in terms of failure, because pipelines, once it hits production, it's uh, heavily relied on. Your whole management is going to look into it. And a P0, P1 issue at that point is not really helping uh, your career. Uh, and next part of that is to think in terms of airflow. For that, you have to understand airflow's nuances deeply. For each task, uh, there is a ton of operators in a pipeline for airflow from Python operator, Kubernetes operator, Bash operator, Docker operator, and there are providers like S3, Google, with each its own operators together. So which operator should we use? And what are the pros and cons of using one over the other? Like the example of spinning up multiple tasks on the fly dynamically, do we need that? Uh, that comes up a lot in the use cases, so whether we need that or not. What are the Airflow features we are going to rely on? Are we going to rely on creating Airflow connections, variables, uh, trigger rule? What are the, like I said, uh, the flow kind of has some dependency rule. If a, if a task is going to fail, are we going to proceed with the pipeline, or are we going to stop right there and call out an alert? So these are the nuanced uh, decisions that you have to make. Some of this mil might pop up only after you go to production, but just be doing this pipeline design in a room with your managers and with the stakeholders can bring this up, and it will save us a lot of time when things go live. And for the folder structure, uh, there is a lot of debate around this. I still recommend this. Uh, if you go to Astronomer, they recommend a different one. I like to separate things out and keep it as open as possible. My DAGs rely uh, separately. My scripts, all the scripts, I have it independent of Airflow. Uh, if I write any custom operators, custom hooks, all of that goes into that. And if I'm writing custom plugins, there's a separate folder for that. And don't forget the test. Because you're using Airflow, because it's a well-tested, uh, out-of-the-box thing that we're using, we cannot skip tests. And of course, we have the requirements in the Docker file. Uh, yes, local environment. There is almost a 50-50 chance that I go on a client call, and I ask them to test something on local. And people go like, no, it doesn't work on my local. Airflow right now is not really hard to set it up on your local machine. So ensure that you have your local set up. Even if you can't set up Airflow locally, ensure that your scripts can run independently so that when you put it there, uh, you can see your DAGs and you can see your scripts at least working independent of each other so that when you put together, you have a minimal debug time. People spend a ton of time debugging just days in and days out because the cycle to get your DAGs in and get uh, see it on live is pretty much a lot. 
this is another client call. I had to take a screenshot right there. Out of the box, one day, something was not working. This was their requirements file. Please, please do lock your requirements. Some, some of these sounds very common. It's a developer, ignorant, uh, trying to fix a P0, puts a library in there, forgets it, and li uh, three months later, it will cause another uh, greater chaos. That is all on the developer end. We have bashed them enough. Now let's talk about infrastructure. What should you think about and what should you not? Let's use Kubernetes. That should solve all our scale, sales scaling problem. It's a very classic thing to do. And uh, unfortunately, I hope it ends there, but it's not. Kubernetes is my favorite way to deploy Airflow, managed or otherwise. Let's not get into that debate. But after using uh, Kubernetes, there are cases where the actual person who set up the infrastructure leaves, and there is no way to know what they have used to set up that infrastructure. So I always say code is the ultimate truth. So go for infrastructure automation, use Terraform or Ansible or Pulumi, anything of your choice to set up your infrastructure. Another great thing about Airflow is once you have one environment set up, you would definitely want another, be it dev, staging, uh, live uh, production, or another team, another project wanting to adopt Airflow. You are always going to need more Airflow environments. So automate as much as you can. The time you are spending on this will not go waste. I can promise you that. Uh, it's Bhavani certified, you can call it. Uh, CICD pipelines, as I was talking about developer productivity, it has been really hard to test Airflow pipelines. Uh, if you're doing it in local, great, but you cannot test the volume, you cannot test it with your mock data. So CICD pipelines, again, getting DAGs in, there are three different ways to do it. Uh, you can mount it as a volume to the scheduler, or you can have scheduler sync it from your GitHub, or you can build it all into a Docker image and put it in there. Which of these should you use is, again, depending on what poison you're choosing. Uh, if you don't have a lot of DAGs that is constantly changing, you can go for a Docker image. Uh, if you have a lot of developers constantly pushing things into GitHub, you can go for the GitHub uh, sync method. Mount volume is, again, a variation of GitHub-based thing. So what people do is there is a CI-CD pipeline sitting on your GitHub, uh, syncing it to the mount volume. So again, these two, if it's like a lot, uh, lot of developers involved and people are constantly pushing, and if there is not a lot of development involved, Docker image might be an answer. <coughs> so the CI CD pipeline, the whole concept around is it to faster developer productivity so that your developers do not fight against the developer environment. Logging. Uh, it is very easy to get shown away, so I'm going to show you a uh, log of something I've run this morning. Hopefully it comes up. So this is a task log. I have done nothing but printing hello world here. And this is the place where it's going to log your pipeline. Hey, I've read something from S3. Hey, uh, this thing failed. You're going to see all the errors here. And you would uh, keep this so preciously in your S3 buckets or an elastic search or wherever you're, you store your logs. But it's very common to miss this junk here. This uh, are your component logs, your scheduler, worker, uh, triggerer. All these logs reside here. And it's very common for you to miss these out. But don't throw it away. Do store it. What happens? One fine morning, you would wake up, and your pipelines would have not even started. There is no. Uh, no more green blobs here, no more tasks there living, and how do we know why it hasn't started? We know that it rely the, only the scheduler has an idea why a particular task has started or hasn't started. So do, do preserve your component logs, because only there you will have an idea of why something hasn't started. So if you go to a scheduler log and see maybe probably there was not enough resources, probably the scheduler was stuck in a loop, was, uh, there was a deadlock, anything could have happened. If there is no logs, you cannot trace back why something has or has not happened. So that is what to store. And it should, it should be searchable. You should uh, store what DAGs does it uh, belong to, what is your workflow, what task, what are the tags, uh, when did this happen, what has happened. Uh, 
whether you want info, info level logs or debug level logs, uh, I leave it up to you. But make it searchable because you would need to drill it down when there is an issue in production. Monitoring and alerting. <coughs> this is again, people kind of tend to discard it because what once in a while it reaches 90%. What harm can it do? But actually not. Uh, set up your Grafana and Prometheus. Have it there because two days back, uh, like it can occur. Like two days back, something happened. There's this one particular task which didn't go through. Five days later, everything was fine. What happened? If you go to your monitoring dashboard, you would see like a huge spike happened out of nowhere, and there is no way to trace it back. So investment on that will really, really come handy. Resource allocation, uh, we are talking about infrastructure again. This is a constant battle between dev and the ops team. Uh, dev constantly says that infra is not giving me enough resource to run my pipeline. And the uh, infrastructure people keeps on pushing more and more data until they ran out of nodes in their Kubernetes cluster. Very common thing to happen. Had we done the pipeline design, we can uh, overcome this. We won't have that resource-hungry uh, workflows. Even if there is, we would be prepared to manage it. Thank you. On the other hand, we have uh, infrastructure people saying, this is all we got. Do it with, uh, within this. And that's, again, a debate that goes on between these two teams. Uh, again, it's, uh, it's a matter of finding the perfect balance um, so depending on your business use case, depending on the importance of your pipelines, you can choose whether you're going to be uh, free with resources or uh, be constrained in our environments. Finally, last but not the least, the team. When I was uh, first using Airflow, this is the constant battle. Airflow is not working, period. We don't get any other information apart from that. Just Airflow is not working. And me, as a only person who was holding the photo of Airflow in the company, have to go and see what, the, what happened. You will see a red dot instead of a green dot. And I have to go through the logs, and I will immediately find out that the developer has mixed, missed an exception, and the thing failed. But ultimately, it will come to Airflow has stopped working. So even though there is a dev and an ops team who is dev team responsible for your pipelines, your workflows, what happens in, if things fail, and there is an ops team which is going to be doing your infrastructure maintenance. Yes, it's a two teams job, and they have to work so close together because when something fails, who is responsible is going to be a It can be a battle. Uh, there is also a third version of developer here who is kind of uh, involving the script writer versus the Airflow developer itself. So the nuances between these three teams or these three stakeholders can be tricky to handle. Last but not least, the biggest mistake that you can do is not using the Airflow community effectively. We have Slack, which has about 7K plus members. Uh, we have Stack Overflow, which has 15 quick questions. And we have GitHub issues and discussions, always keeping people like Jarek very busy. And not using them would come as a biggest mistake. Slack is my favorite. I am on like 13 plus Slack channels. Airflow is the one where people help each other, rather one person or one company supporting it 24 bar 7. I really love that about Airflow. And if you have questions, if you have any crazy uh, experience with Airflow, I, let's do that. OK. Thank you very much for a great presentation. I'm going to, you know, when it's going to be recorded, I'm going to uh, show it to everyone who wants to have answers about Airflow. Uh, but are there any questions? Uh, OK. There. Thank you. I have one question. Uh, the, because most of us are working on some of the cloud services like AWS, would you recommend the managed, uh, managed version from Airflow, or would you do the self-managed? <laughs> would you make it for your own? OK. Uh, this, is, this is another question that comes. I slightly escaped that question, even the presentation. Uh, AWS is that comes a lot. It takes about 30 minutes for a small config change to reflect. 
uh, that comes up, that is one thing that is preventing people from using AWS managed over a self-managed service. Whereas if you're using services like Astronomer, I work for Astronomer inside and outside. Uh, I really love it as an infrastructure. So managed services, Astronomer just does it beautifully. AWS, it comes with a trade-off of your developer productivity. They have to wait for 30 minutes if there is any. Okay. Composer. Oh, it's getting better. Yeah, it's all. It always gets better. <laughs> That's the best part about Airflow. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Oh, lots of questions. Hi. Hi. Uh, great talk. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, um, do you have a recommendation for how to manage the DAC code base on a central instance if you have many teams wanting to make changes uh, independently of each other? So right now, like um, I'm in a platform team, we are operating a central instance, but there's now five data teams who deploy their DACs, and it's going to be more in the future. So, um, and right now it's kind of a bottleneck that everybody has to get their uh, GitHub uh, pull request approved centrally at the right. moment. Um, but uh, yeah, what would be your recommendation like on a, like a scaling organization where more and more teams adopt it? Currently, I don't think there's a feature where it has to be in one repository and it has to be if, if there is one instance, it has to have all the DAGs as a part of that uh, instance, right? Be it in GitHub or a Docker image. Uh, so out of the box, Airflow does not support it. How do I, uh, how do I design it? Is a separate consulting call should be. <laughs> Can I help you? Yes, please. Because uh, there is an unknown, uh, well, not a little known feature. Mm. Uh, we well, can use Git sub modules, and there, there is a fantastic talk uh, from last year Airflow Summit from London. Uh, uh, the team, uh, uh, I can't remember the team na name that was doing that, but the, f the first talk from Airflow Summit, actually, the first talk Airflow Summit last year, they were talking about running Airflow with 194 repositories of DAGs, ah, okay. one repository per DAG using sub, -mo sub modules. So the, it's, it's possible. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for the talk. Um, you said that as uh, Airflow manager, you are directly responsible if something breaks. Yeah. Is there a possibility to um, distribute errors so maybe see, okay, there broke something in the new data that was arriving or in the new code commit and therefore automatically ping the developer instead of going through the Airflow manager that takes a quick look and says, well, you were responsible. Right. Uh, that's where the alerting part of it comes in the picture. So even in your pipeline, you can set up alerts for the errors that you already know is going to happen. And when something happens, you can put it in our, uh, either send an email or send it to Slack. And there is some, you can send it to certain channels. You can do all that. But at that time, we, I was new to Airflow. Everybody was new to Airflow. So it, that chaos was around that. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your excellent talk. I have one question around uh, uh, dependencies. So mm -hmm. in the beginning, you showed like a, a S3 operation and requires probably Boto. How would you manage like um, uh, all the dependencies from Python from the different tasks? Do, you have any, do we have any recommendations for that? Uh, can you repeat that again? Like yeah, so for example, you have a lot of uh, Python mm -hmm. packages that you yeah. depend on to, right. uh, in, the, in the operators. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any recommendations on how to manage those? Uh, Right now, Airflow only supports requirements file. So even like the setup of the package comes with a requirements file right out of the box. So you can put it here. There is going to be conflict with, between what Airflow automatically installs with what, what you use. And that is something we have to live with. Even yesterday, I was talking to Jarek about the similar, same problem that I also had with the libraries. So we are constrained by what Airflow installs. This is what we install. Just, just to add to that, mm -hmm. because I'm the creator of the constraint yes, uh, <laughs> idea in Airflow, and uh, a little bit of self-promotion or uh, <laughs> promotion. Uh, we are running Airflow Summit uh, in Toronto in September 2023, first time in person. So if you haven't signed up yet, sign up. It's, and if you're interested about 
meeting all the people that are uh, about <laughs> Airflow, go and, and sign up. It's uh, airflowsummit.org. And I'm gonna, gonna give a presentation there, which is called uh, the dependency, uh, what's the name? All you wanted to ask about dependencies and afraid to ask, or something like that, very closely. <laughs> I already gave the presentation once at the, at the London meetup, and I'm gonna give a very short presentation about that, like 30 minutes, con uh, condensating the stuff. Uh, however, a lot of uh, 262, which I mentioned uh, recently, it has uh, documentation changes about the dependencies and constraints and how to manage conflicting dependencies for Airflow. Everything that I'm talking about this talk, in this talk is already in the documentation and there are some guidelines how to do that, how to manage the, the you know, manage constraints and conflicting dependencies, how to install them together, how to approach it, how to do if you <laughs> really have to install the BD, <laughs> because that's, that used to be a problem. And all, all the stuff is now in the documentation. And you can ask also questions on Slack as well, as, as Ravan, uh, as, as you mentioned before. Uh. A small question, it was related to the previous question, so maybe transfer this, uh, talking a bit about you have many different teams Mm -hmm. with different things that they can, should do, so it's a bit related to the multi-tenancy aspect, like uh, how do you handle that, like, or are there any suggestions to having different airflow environments, or maybe like with Kitsum models, or what are suggestions on this area? Okay. Um, this is the use case that I've seen, okay. Maybe I will give you this use case, tell me if that's the same thing, okay? So there is like multiple teams who have different scripts and they all want to run on Airflow, not necessarily use Airflow features, but they have scripts and they all need their independent requirements and independent uh, libraries and environment to run. For example, Go as crazy as running Go scripts or Rust scripts for that matter, right? Even at that level, there is something called as Kubernetes pod operator, which, to which you can point a Docker image which has the whole environment that you need to run a particular uh, task. So you can just use Kubernetes pod operator in Airflow and point it to that Docker image, which is going to run your Go scripts or Rust scripts or even Python scripts with very specific libraries. Um, so that is the way to go. Thank you. Any more questions? Yes. Thanks, thanks for the talk. Um, so DBT was mentioned, so is, is <laughs> the, is, uh, we, we are running it in the, in the Kubernetes pod, mm -hmm. but is, is that still kind of the, the right way to do it currently, or what are the, what are the best, best practices? Can you Ru that? Running uh, DBT On. In, in Airflow, mm -hmm. so w what's, what's currently the, the, the way to do it? I'm not aware of it. I haven't worked with DBT yet, so. I have no idea because I don't run Airflow. I just develop Airflow. <laughs> uh, so I, I, I wouldn't say I know, but uh, uh, there is the documentation I mentioned. It mentioned like if you want to install DBT in Airflow environment, do this, and there are steps ah. to follow. So yeah, it's possible. <laughs> Thank you for a great presentation. I was just wondering if we cannot avoid long running tasks mm -hmm. and the parallelism is not intuitive. How, what are your recommendations? How do you manage, like, you know, if we have tasks that runs for hours and we end up with the queue, you know, stacked up right. queue, how do you manage this part of weird niche usage of Airflow? <laughs> Right. Uh, that's where the Celery plus Kubernetes executor comes really handy because those tasks, I can say, don't run with Celery, don't mess up with my workers, uh, and offload it to a Kubernetes executor, which is going to give, its, give it the necessary resources that it needs, and it's, it will run independently without uh, hogging all my workers and its resources. Okay, so you, you still need a combination of Celery and Kubernetes? You just can't go with Kubernetes alone? Uh, you can also do Kubernetes pod operator for uh, that particular task if you know it beforehand. And you can give it the, just the right amount of resources for it to run. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, 
Maybe, maybe to add to that, because uh, it's really hard to keep up. We also have a local Kubernetes executor now. So you can have local tasks running Should tasks and Kubernetes and offloading some of them to Kubernetes. You don't have to have Celery for that. And that's, that also works in a number of cases where you have most of the things running on a, enough to run on a single machine, big one, and then a big, big task offloaded to Kubernetes, then local Kubernetes executor is good for you. And it's, it's very recent, so that's like... <laughs> <laughs> no, like 2550, five, five, two five uh, anything else? No, 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 okay. no more questions. No more questions. Okay, thank thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you. Thank you.